Revive us again, setting our faith and hope. Welcome to New Chapel United Methodist Church. We're glad you could join us this Sunday morning. Uh, let me give you a few announcements before I forget. Uh, the bishop has put out a memo requesting that we not have services during the month of May to continue the um, social distancing. And so we're honoring that and we're not going to have services uh, the month of May. So hopefully we'll see you the first Sunday in June. Um, if you're a normal attendee at New Chapel and you get an upper room, would you do me a favor and text me? Tell me who you are when you text and tell me which kind of upper room you would like and the number. And that way I'll make sure you get them uh, this next week. Remember my text number is 915 excuse me, 615-983-0255. Um, just go ahead and text me, tell me who you are and the number. Um, please remember, if you decide to use church property for an activity or you want to come use the pavilion, please use the social distancing guidelines. It, will, it just makes everybody happier and then we don't have a problem. Um, Email address keeps gets, keeps getting reset. I don't know why, so we're going to work this next week to make sure that all the emails go out to the right locations. Sometimes things seem to be on them and some, some email addresses disappear. So we're going to try to make sure that that, that gets taken care of. Um, you're going to need your Bible just to make sure. I think I can put the slides on this today, but we'll see. And But just to be sure, go ahead and pause it and get your Bibles and then come back. Well, where we're going to be is we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, and 1 Peter 1, 17 through 23. Also, though, Acts chapter 2, the first part of 14 and then finishing up with 36 through 41 is a great resource and a great passage of Scripture to have when you're looking at, um, uh, at, at Peter's description of the Christian walk. And so it works, it works pretty well. So uh, take your Bibles and at your leisure, please read Acts 2, 14 and then 36 through 41. We're going to have a call to worship today, and it's from Psalms 116, the first part. So if you would join me this morning in a call to worship. I love the Lord. Because He inclined His ear to me. The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. I suffer distress and anguish. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Well, prayer requests, to just remind you, you can send them to me by email to Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at T-N-U-M-C dot com or mtreen at gmail.com. You can also text me at 615-983-0255 and we had a couple of people contact me. So we do have some, we do have some prayer requests. Uh, we need to be remembering the family of Joe Teasley. That's T.D. Justice's brother. He passed away. And so we need to remember that family. Dave Garman is in the last stages of cancer. June Tab's granddaughter's step-grandfather. So that's the connection to us. Uh, James Hardy Reynolds is Gina's uncle. He passed away in his sleep. And so please remember the Reynolds family and Gina also. We need to continue to lift up Jane Hickman. Uh, she's having good days and bad days, and we just need to pray that, her, that the good days overcome. 
and that her physical therapy, uh, she has physical therapy at the house, so we pray that, that that works well. Also, Ann Proctor, I talked to her today. She's doing better. Um, she's learning how to cope with, with, with different things that are going on, but generally she's doing good and just appreciates everybody's prayers. Um, we also need to lift up um, Carol Goosetree. Uh, she has gotten results back from the pathologist and um, it's, the margins were good, so she's gonna be on some, some medication. And their daughter, Pam, um, also, also had surgery and she is starting uh, radiation uh, for a six week, I think it's a six week bout. So we need to pray for, for uh, Pam and, and Carolyn and make sure that God that God touches them. Well, I kind of want to set the tone this morning um, by looking at something out of 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2.23, kind of the last part, says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. Well, as we get started this morning and looking at Revive Us Again, setting our faith and hope, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to come to you this morning. We just thank you that that you have um, that you have that you have loved us, that you have protected us, and Lord, you have given us a way that we can set our faith and you, that we can set our hope. Those things are sure. So, Lord, when we do that, we pray that you would revive us again. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I do have to tell you one little minor thing. <clears throat> I may get interrupted. Um, we are do, able to do this again on a Saturday night instead of a Sunday morning. And our dog is extremely confused as to what I'm doing standing in the living room talking to the TV set. And so, so if, I ten, if I get distracted here in a second, it's because the dogs come in. Um, the, so apologize about that. Setting our faith. That's the first thing we're going to be looking at. Um, and we're going to look at a classic passage of Scripture that's going to talk about setting our faith. In the second or third, in, in this period after Easter, um, it's kind of interesting that these Sundays are listed of Easter as opposed to in Easter. Before Easter, it was a Sunday in Lent. But this is a continued celebration of what happened on Easter Sunday. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a continued celebration of the resurrection that took place. And so the passage of Scripture we're going to be looking at today is the beginning is Luke 24, verses 33 through 35. It's the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 13 through 35, and the word says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him and said, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we have hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the three, third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They went at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they had, they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones! and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? <clears throat> and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent." So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. 
and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scripture? And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Why is this passage of the road to Emmaus so important? The key to understanding is found in the previous verse, in verse 12 of Luke 24. It says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Look, Peter, the rock, went home marveling. Look, we talked about Jesus and his appearance to the disciples last week. So we already know the ending. Uh, the general mood, however, it seems is one of disbelief and confusion because the disciples went into hiding. The pair making the seven mile walk to Emmaus weren't any more out of touch than anyone else that they met. You know, we, we sometimes we would have criticized them and saying, well, they didn't have an understanding. They didn't know. But the disciples and all those around went and hid themselves away. They didn't understand. Because what did Jesus say? What, how did they describe him? The guys from Emmaus said he was a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We hoped he was going to be the one to bring the kingdom. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. And when they didn't find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of those who went with us into the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. They didn't understand. But as soon as Jesus appeared to them, as soon as he broke bread and they understood that the person that had been teaching them about the prophets and about how the law had to be fulfilled, as soon as they realized it was Jesus, they rose and went and returned to Jerusalem that same hour. They went at night. They didn't wait till the next day for the bus. They got out. They got, they got out of their house and they headed to Jerusalem. And then they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered, and, and, and the ones that were gathered were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. All of a sudden, this whole thing that Jesus had been talking about, this whole thing about resurrection, now suddenly it's real. Now suddenly it's not just a theory. Now suddenly it's not just a story. Now it's suddenly something that they understand. Their definition of Jesus had been entirely too small. It had been too tiny, too restricted. But now Jesus had conquered death and he had appeared. That's definitely a hallelujah moment. Their definition of Jesus was too small. Hmm. That would also preach. Remember what Jesus told Thomas last week when we talked. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, that's us. We are blessed because we believe and we didn't actually see him rise, but we know that he did. The Emmaus conversation goes a long way to set our faith in stone. Because they doubted. They didn't think it would have happened. They were so confused and then all of a sudden they realized this is real. But there's a key player in this discussion that wants us to understand a little bit something deeper. You know, we've now got revive us again. We've set our faith. What Jesus said was right. We believe it. All right. Our faith is set. But Peter wants us to understand something a little differently. What Peter says in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, 13-23 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. 
since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, <clears throat> who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. Notice what it says. It says, set your hope. Prepare your minds for action. Having been sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace. That is our hope. We hope in the grace. The grace of God is what gives us hope. Grace of God and that surety of His grace is what not only takes our faith, but it gives us the hope which solidifies our faith. And we know for certain that Christ has forgiven, that God has forgiven us, that Christ has redeemed us. Hope is a relationship in the Creator of the universe. We're obedient children. We're part of His family. Do you see that? Do you see that? Being sober-minded, set your hope that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. You don't call somebody an obedient child or they're not part of the family. And because of that, because of that hope, because of what God has already done to us, our response is to be holy. Now, we intuitively understand that we don't deserve this. We don't deserve that grace. We don't deserve that forgiveness. We don't deserve any of the things that, that God is giving us except punishment and death. But He doesn't do that. He has forgiven us. That is His grace. That is our hope. And that's what we can rest on. We can rest on the hope that is in that that is Jesus' redemptive blood and His broken body has purchased for us. And our response is to be holy. You see, it's a response. It's not a checklist. It's a response that we begin to look at our lives and we begin to analyze our lives and we begin to say, is the conversation I'm having, does that bring glory to God? Is the television show I'm watching, does that bring glory to God? See, now I'm meddling. Uh, is the book I'm reading, does that bring glory to God? Is the conversation I'm having with another person at New Chapel or the person in the, in the, in the, uh, in the grocery store, even though I'm six feet apart, is that bringing glory to God? See, everything we do has to be from a perspective of holiness. We are holy just like He's holy. We've been adopted. So, revive us again. Set our faith, set our hope. And when these are reset in our lives, when these are reset, when that hope is set, when that faith is set, when they're in our spirits, when they're in our souls, then we will be revived. And we will be enthusiastic. And when we truly, truly begin to reflect the hope that is in our hearts, we can't help but tell others about it. And watch out. Watch out. Because the world can get changed. Can we go to prayer? Well, Lord, we thank you for this time this morning. Lord, I thank you for the the sounds that are going on around me that I didn't realize were happening. Lord, I thank you for the, uh, for the many blessings, though, that you've given us. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the, my wonderful, the wonderful friends and those that are called of God uh, to be with us 
uh, this morning. Lord, just bless us. Father, revive us again. And Lord, deep inside us, set our faith on, in you and set our hope in you. And Lord, like we said, when that happens, we will be revived. God bless. Take care. Hope to see you someday.